So many of you know me, many of you know me and my Centre for Responsible Business. Can you see if I stand here? Is that all right? Okay. Um, but that's my background, which was briefly summarised for you. So I have a background with the embassy here. I also have a background in business and then MCRB for the last four years or so. And MCRB is based in um, Alone, Shinsoku Road. That's our team. And we were set up, I feel you can't see this, you're appearing. Can you see all right? Or do you want to move a bit so I can stand here? And... Okay. So I, I sweated blood over these, uh, these slides. Um, so we were set up uh, in 2013 to work on responsible business at a time that particularly international investment was coming into the country, but also because of the reforms, Myanmar businesses were also looking to change. We're looking to adopt international standards and we're wanting to understand what those are, as was the government. So we are working on building knowledge, capacity and dialogue across um, different stakeholders, business, government and civil society groups. Um, we have worked a lot on cross-cutting issues around responsible business. Our most recent um, uh, report is this one on discrimination, which is very topical at the moment. Not just discrimination on grounds of religion, ethnicity, but also uh, LGBT, women, disability, HIV status, and so on. And these are briefing papers for business that tell what are the Myanmar laws, what is the Myanmar context, and what are the international standards, and what are the um, recommendations for businesses to avoid discrimination in the workplace and uh, in their products as well. We've done other briefing papers, similar sorts of issues that you can see up here. Everything is on our website. We've also done a lot of work on sectors, so the oil and gas sector, tourism sector, ICT and mining, and we're currently working on oil palm. In terms of what responsible business is, we anchor ourselves to international standards, but there's no one definition of responsible business. You find many of these standards here, particularly the OECD guidelines have a very wide agenda, and broadly, that's what you can see um, here. So it's around obeying the law, number one, which is very difficult here because the law is almost impossible to obey if you're a business, or the many laws. They are very um, user friendly very unclear, and that's a major source of problem for corruption. Not paying bribes, or tea money as it's called here, definitely, um, a requirement for a responsible business. And then there are others here which I won't talk about so much, but transparency, again, very much tied to, to corruption. Um, and respecting human rights, that can also um, have, or rather corruption can have an impact on whether people's human rights are respected by a company. For example, if you bribe the health and safety inspector or, or the mining inspector. So we have worked on business integrity, which some people prefer to call it because they see corruption as being a, a very strong word, um, in different ways. We've done training for companies, uh, and we've talked about this also with government, with civil society. We've done translation of various toolkits. The one, the sort of yellow and blue and red one, is the Transparency International one called um, the Business Integrity Principles. And we translated the SME version as a practical kit for what companies could do if they want to improve their uh, performance in this area. But we also helped with the translation of another project, similar building on that, but specific to Myanmar, which has got specific Myanmar examples in there as well to make it more, more real. Um, we've been working with the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, who've recently scaled up the number of people they've got working on this. Previously, they had nobody in country. They've now got six or seven people. Um, I think perceiving that with the change of government there's going to be more opportunity to work on it. And we're currently working also with the World Bank, uh, or rather the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, which is part of the World Bank, to establish a Myanmar Institute of Directors to be something which encourages companies to raise their standards of corporate governance by giving their directors training um, and by exposing them to better ways of, of working on these issues. And then we've tested the system a bit. You can read about what we did with Muay Sound sand mining on our website, but let me just explain. We um, have been concerned about sand mining in the beaches. Do you want to move? <laughs> I'll sit over there and you'll see everything. Um, 
So we've been concerned about sand mining in the beaches in Napoli, in Waysound, because it's going to destroy what is an asset for tourism for the future, but also because if you take sand from the beach, it creates further erosion, and so it's actually going to make people more vulnerable to cyclones and so on. Um, and what we saw in Waysound, a number of us when we were there on holiday last year, was very extensive sand mining in a particular part of the beach, uh, with trucks coming on there approximately every 20 minutes, loading up with sand, driving off. So we um, managed to tape record one of the drivers, and he, we talked to him about it, saying, um, so why are you doing this? And he says, oh, my boss pays 30,000 chats per month to the head of, of the local GAD, the General Affairs Department. He can take as much as he wants. So we decided to test out the Anti-Corruption Commission on this particular um, example, and we transcribed the tape. We didn't expose the driver's name, we don't even know the driver's name, or for that matter, his boss. But we put it to the Anti-Corruption Commission as a test to see how they would respond, partly because we get asked by companies, should we report things to the Anti-Corruption Commission? And we put it in, and nothing happened. We also thought we would test the Aung San Suu Kyi um, channel, because she had said about a month previously that uh, she was committed to fight corruption and any cases to raise it with her office. So we sent a letter to her office as well. And the months passed, and we heard nothing. But eventually we did. In, in about um, May, so probably four months after we put the case in, we had a call from Waysan GAD, the people we complained about, saying, could you come and visit us? Um, and um, could you bring the victims with you? <laughs> we thought, what victims? <laughs> um, but what, what they um, said was the Anti-Corruption Commission only deals with cases where there is a victim. And we said, well, really, in this particular case, the victims are the children of Moisan. You know, it's their future that's being put onto a truck. Do we need to bring them out of school and bring them along to see you? And also, we feel kind of coming to see you when we've complained about you doesn't strike us as really whistleblower protection. So we said, well, we'll think about whether or not we want to come and see you. Then shortly afterwards, we got a call from Bethane uh, General Ad Administration Department saying they'd received our letter through Anton Sinti's office, which had been passed down to the Irrawaddy Chief Minister. And could we come and see them? And they didn't say this time, could we bring the victim, thank goodness. Um, so we said, OK, we will. And we, we went and met them. And there was everyone there, the fire department, the forestry department, everybody gathered around. So we explained to them why it was that we had taken this, this complaint. Um, and that we weren't after any particular person, but we wanted to actually raise this issue. And we saw it as being a form of corruption. And um, they sort of agreed, yes, you know, not good to take sand from the beach. But they said, this particular stretch of beach we have not designated as protected because the locals wanted sand from there because they were so fed up with the cronies from Rangoon having taken all the other bits of beach. Um, so they wanted this to be their cell for themselves. So we said we had a certain amount of sympathy with their feelings on this, but it was nonetheless going to be very destructive in, in the medium term. But we also said, what is that 30,000 chat that they're paying? Is that a fine? And the guy from Wayside GAD said, no, that's a donation. So, okay, I donate to you and then I get as many truckloads of sand as I want. That's not my understanding of what a donation is. But um, I, I'll just give you that example because I'm going to come back to this question of corruption and donations because it's a word we're hearing more and more linked to it and it worries me. So, we also do a report on a regular basis to try to improve what companies are doing in terms of adopting anti-corruption policies and disclosing information, including about what they're doing on this particular issue, but also other things like how they are um, performing on safety and respecting land rights and so on. So this report, put it aside, everything that we do is, is all online as well, and in hard copy if you want to come to our office and pick it up. This uh, report we've been doing now for the last three years. What we do is we rate companies based on their information that they publish on their website, on anti-corruption policies and how they implement them, on their organisational transparency, who they are, what they own, what their businesses are, what their subsidiary companies are, who their senior management is. And then the third section that we look at is health, safety, environment, human rights um, and engagements with stakeholders. 
So having gone through those um, different issues on their website to see what we can find, we do it for the top 100 biggest taxpayers, which we take as a proxy for the biggest companies. And last year, this was the outcome. So we had two surge pun companies coming out top. We had Max VMR coming out third, bumped off the second place by the fact that we brought in FMI for the first time at the request of, of the company. So FMI is Surge Pun's stock exchange listed company, and Surge Pun and Associates is the family company. And the distinction between what they disclose is largely down to financial information. Uh, Surge is reluctant to put all of his finance finances up on the uh, on the internet, but otherwise both of them have very strong commitments to uh, corruption and, and, and transparency, and that's reflected in the fact that foreign businesses are coming and queuing up at their door. So that's actually one of the key things that an investor, particularly if they're coming from the US or Europe, is looking at. They want to know, does this company understand that as my business partner, as a French company, if they pay bribes, I will go to jail in France, or UK, or the US, or wherever. So that's a very, very strong incentive to choose a Myanmar business partner that understands this issue. So you can see there, these are the top 10 or so. It drops off quite quickly if you look at the total scores on the end. Um, and some of them, like Asia World, only score on their anti-corruption policies. They don't really score much on the rest. And frankly, it becomes a little bit of a cut and paste. And also, I want to underline, this is what they say about themselves. It's not necessarily what they do. And that's obviously the weakness of this. But at least if they are committing to doing these things, you can write to them and say, so show us this, tell us this. What, do you, you know, what exactly, how many of your directors did you train on this? What are your main corruption risks, or, or so on? So it's, it starts to lift the bar a bit. Hope. Next year we're going to, we're not doing it this year, but next year we're going to adapt it to bring it in line with something called the ASEAN Corporate Governance Scorecard, so that it's more regionally comparable, at least as, as far as we can. That's something which is done particularly for ASEAN countries which um, have stock, stock markets, and it focuses much more on how transparency protects shareholders in those, uh, in those countries. So not totally applicable to here, but we will start to try and adapt as much pos as possible to that. Um, we're also going to look more at the public companies in Myanmar. Now there are publicly listed companies in Myanmar, so there are four of those, First Private Bank, FMI, Thilua SEZ Holdings, and mm, we'll look at Luke for help here. Matco is not yet listed, I think. Anyway, only four, but there are about 300 public companies, of which Matco, for example, Uchikine Agricultural Company is one. Um, the Douay public company, which has got a couple of hotels, is another. These were companies which were encouraged, particularly under the later days of the SPDC and also the last government, to be kind of consortia of local companies and then get projects in the area. However, when you put pro companies like that together, what we found is normally they don't trust one another. So they are a prime example of where good corporate governance, good transparency would actually improve their ability to, to function, which is one of the reasons why we're, why we're looking at them. Also, those companies, at least technically, many of them are able to trade shares, even though they're not listed. So again, that's another reason for saying they should be more transparent so that they can give more confidence to people who want to buy shares in those companies. To come back to some definitions. So there's no perfect, single, accepted definition of either corruption or bribery. Every organisation has different ways of describing it, but more or less, corruption usually ends up as boiling down to when you use your position for personal gain. And it could be public or private position. Normally it's seen as being something in the public sector, a government official who takes money um, and puts that in their pocket for some privilege that they give to a business person or someone else. But you could also see it in the private world, for example, journalists who take bribes to write stories. We were talking to a company the other day um, about what uh, their press um, uh, section did, 
and the press officer said, oh, I, I get pictures of my chairman giving rice donations to flood victims in the papers. Of course, I have to pay the journalists to print them. And I said, you know, okay, you're not a government official, but what's that saying about your company? Who else are you going to be paying? You know, is that actually the way to improve governance in this country or improve the reputation of your com company? Do you really need pictures of your chairman giving rice donations, or why not take out an advertisement and make that transparent? So it doesn't have to be um, people in public sector positions taking money, but usually that's where the focus is, because people in public sector positions have the most power as regulators in particular. So bribery, this is a, um, a definition from Transparency International. So it can be about giving or requiring, offering, promising, soliciting, accepting. Um, so it's about something that you give as an inducement, which might be money or a free trip to Hawaii or whatever, um, to get somebody to do something. Or that you ask to get yourself, or so that you yourself as a government official or whatever will do something. So to give you a few more examples of what constitutes bribery. It's not just about brown envelopes and money. It could be all sorts of things. It could be, I'll employ your nephew. We've seen quite a lot of that in, in China of, um, I think, I can't remember which particular New York bank got into trouble for employing the uh, son of a, what's known as a prince lady in China. It was felt that they had given that person a job so that they would get more favours with the Chinese government. It could be about um, offering hospitality. When I was in Napoli quite recently, we were there at the same time as the minister, and he was getting free accommodation from the hotel. Now, is that right? Or is that actually a way of buying him? We would say that in a position like that, there should at least be transparency on the part of the company to say, we gave free hotel nights to the minister um, on the following occasions, even if they don't say exactly what the value is. And equally, we feel that the government should have a policy on this as well. It's a gift in kind. You might remember when the NLD first came, um, or first was elected, they did a lot of training for their MPs and, and officials, and they accepted free hotel rooms from Teza and from Usina, just around the corner. Is that right? You know, why were these, uh, these guys saying, oh yes, let us help you out? At least it needs to be transparent and recorded, and ideally the company should have a policy on it, and the government should have a policy on it. Political donations make US politics run. Some countries allow them, some don't. But at least political donations in the US are all registered in order to prevent as much as possible them being used for corrupt purposes. So there's a few other um, ones here, offsets. You know, For example, I'm not going to um, charge you tax for that, uh, but, trying to think, sorry, a good example of, of this. Um, I can't, gone out of my head. Um, but you know, we're, well, offsets is basically where you do something in return for forgetting about something else. How is this country doing? on corruption. I don't actually like this index very much because I don't think it reflects what I've known about corruption in Myanmar in the past, particularly. For example, a country I know very well, Guinea, um, used to come out much higher than, than Myanmar in, term, in terms of being much better. And actually, my experience was it was much, much worse. So I don't think this is a particularly accurate measure of corruption. To some extent, in the old days, Myanmar people almost used to take pride saying, you know, we're at the bottom of this index. I, I didn't have time to get you the 2013-2012 rankings, but it was way, way down. It was like 160 or something. It, you were in the, the very dark red zone. You can see here there's an improvement, which I think is a fair, fair trend. These are the scores that, that Myanmar's gradually been getting. And there were some jumps up in 2013 when a new anti-corruption law was brought in by the same same government, and then a further jump up in 2016 when the NLD was elected and they brought in their code of conduct for civil servants. 
So the trend for Myanmar is definitely positive. That's also borne out in these figures. These come from the World Bank, and I think they're better, A, because they're more detailed, but also because they compare Myanmar with other uh, countries. So let's just look at these in a bit more detail. I'm not sure whether I'm going to point at them. That's going to work. I'm not sure if I can press that. It's going to be terrible. Top. Top. Okay. So what you've got here is the results of a survey which, although they called it 2016, actually was done 2016 to April 2017. So definitely after the NLD government came into power. And then what you've got in brackets here is the way they ranked in 2014. That survey, I think, was done in November 2014. So that was under the same same government. So you can see on almost every rating, there is an improvement. And how these figures were done was by surveying business owners. Altogether, 607 different companies. I think most of them were in Yangon, Mandalay, and maybe a couple of other towns. And so they asked them various questions related to these different issues. And then they also asked those same issues on a regular basis to other countries in the region and other countries globally. So that's the second and the third um, column here. Now, compared to East Asia Pacific, Myanmar is not actually that much worse. And in some cases, it's a lot better. This is a very big difference. So for East Asia Pacific, and that includes Japan, it includes Cambodia, it includes China, it includes the Solomon Islands, there is 45% of firms say that if they're trying to get a government contract, they have to give gifts. Now for Myanmar, two years ago, it was 32.5, so more or less comparable, but still better. Now it's gone down to 9.8, which is a massive improvement. And that, I think, is a reflection of the government's commitment to fighting corruption. The next figure down is also something which is um, linked to that, because that's about how much do you have to give, how big are the bribes to get a government contract. And there you can see very expensive in the Asia Pacific region. That's gone up quite dramatically, that's why I've coloured it in red. It was about 1.5, I think, last year. However, in Myanmar, it's come right down. So again, that's a positive, positive trend. And then these are the global figures, so for all countries. So Myanmar is a lot better than the global average on that. Now, the flip side of that is that if you talk to businesses here, they say, now nothing gets done. Nothing is being signed. Previously, it was much easier. We just pay a bit or whatever, and we could get the deals done. So there is a problem on that here, but I still think in terms of trying to clean up government, it's a very positive outcome that we're seeing here. Construction, still a major issue. Some of, I think that's the worst of the scores, in effect. And it's gone up slightly actually compared to um, what it was last year. It's approximately on a par with the region. Construction is definitely the sector that has the most corruption in it, both in terms of corruption around land and acquisition of you know, prime plots in downtown Rangoon, but also getting permits. And that's a problem globally, um, not just here, not just in Asia. Other ones, lots of, of good scores in terms of improvements, and again, as I say, in most cases, a lot better than the Asian average. Water, still a problem. There isn't much of it here in Rangoon. It's a big worry more generally, but if you want to get it, you, uh, you're going to have to pay for it above and below the table. In fact, you pay for it much more below the table than you do above. That's part of the problem. We don't have proper water pricing in Yangon, which is why we're going to run out of it. Any, any thoughts on this? Any questions? Any comments? Does this seem right, surprising, wrong to you? Any chance to drink? Would it 
be that uh, there are less farms buying for government contracts, and that's why some of them are the on them? It, it could be that. It could be that their sample, which was not entirely construction companies, um, might have had a better experience that year. However, I suspect they were also basing themselves on what their friends in construction companies were telling them. Um, but are you saying you don't, you don't believe it? <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't get reported after a while it gets Who are big players to improve this situation? I mean, to stop corruption, but also to make more transparency. Who are big players right now? Mm. But the, compared to 2014, it's improved. And uh, I don't know who are to try to improve mm. it. Well, I would say that this reflects most of all leadership from the top. That this was something which the, the government and Tsu Chi made a top priority and was almost the first thing they did, in fact, it was almost the only thing they did, I would say, in their first 100 days, was announce a new gifts policy, and I'll come on to that in a minute, and send a strong tone for the top. I don't know if you remember, if you were around last Thinjan, um, that a certain well-known construction company gave a gift of around $5,000 to a member of Suchi's office. And the sort of NLD went, and although they didn't say who it was, we all know it was Shui Fan Nguyen. Um, and um, that, I think, is a really important signal. You know? So from that perspective, however, as I've said from the other side, the way things worked before has now almost ground to a halt to the extent that um, Officials are also even too scared to either sign off or put up projects that should be signed off because they don't want to be accused of, you know, how much have you taken, you know, what's behind all of this. So it's actually slowed down the economy in some ways. So one has to find that balance whereby you have the procedures in place, the people trust them and say, yep, yeah, okay, you've done a tender on this, it all looks fair and square, and we've got the Auditor General to check it if necessary, and, okay, sign off, get the road built, get the power station built. Okay. So, as we were saying, I don't know if you can read that. So this is, this is the NLD's anti-corruption policy. So this was brought in in um, early April 2016, 17, 16, yes. And so the main point it did was to significantly reduce the um, acceptable value of a gift that you could give to a government official. Previously under Thain saying it was something like 300,000 chat, which is massive, bigger than many government officials' salaries. Now it's 25,000 chat. And there are much more clear guidelines around who may not receive any gifts and how those gifts may receive, be received. But there's also these points about exceptions where, um, for example, for Thedinja or Christmas, um, you can give a, uh, a gift of 100,000. So those city mark fruit baskets, which are, I'm sure worth more than 25,000, they're still okay. Not brilliant. Some companies refuse to do any, of, any gift giving because they feel anything could be questionable and it's easier just to say no. You'll find, for example, most Norwegian companies, Telenor, um, I mean, Telenor won't even take me out to, to lunch, so strict is their, is their policy. But they don't give gifts. What they may do is give you, you know, a Telenor mug, uh, but they're not going to be giving you a Telenor iPad. Um, that's not true of all companies. Um, another point is uh, that um, you can't receive gifts repetitively, so it's no good giving somebody 25,000 chats once a week. You know, there are various, I've, I've cut and pasted a, a few bits of it, but there are more restrictions around that. So it's a pretty good policy, frankly, and it's a lot better and clearer than what was, what was there before. I have heard, however, that people were being stopped by the police, and whereas previously they would be charged 30,000, now they're charged 25,000. So people have adapted uh, and again, we're back to that question of you know, gifts, donations, bribes. Um, but anyway, it's, a, it's definitely a step forward and it definitely had, I think, a effect on perceptions outside of the country. So what else 
needs to change on this. Um, I would say this is fundamentally the responsibility of government. There's only so far you can go with businesses, and I'll come back to some of those issues, but if government has not got proper transparent tendering procedures in place, has not got these kind of rules which are then enforcing them and then doing it publicly, because a little bit of public name and shame certainly scares people. If you just have a thing on paper but you never hear of anybody actually being caught out with it, you can be sure that it won't uh, work very um, effectively. Um, one of the things that businesses say when we ask them what could government do more of is be more public on the kind of fees for services and also how long something should expect to take. Uh, you know, if you're going to be paying for um, a, uh, a safety license for your guest house, you know, a fire safety license, what's the process for doing it? How much is it going to cost? And then obviously those things need to be receipted as well. So more transparency around government fees is definitely something where this government has a long way to go. Putting more procedures online. The fewer people you have involved in a transaction, the more it's depersonalized by being online, the better. Singapore does almost all of its government transactions online. Of course, you need an internet connection, which we more or less have now, at least in most places, but you need credit card systems and so on, which is still um, lacking uh, a bit. Reducing government red tape is a hugely important step towards reducing corruption. There is a, a, a study that was done, this is Tam here, Tam, 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 she was going to come. So Tam Guna did this when she was working for the Tourism Working Group of Myanmar Business Forum, looking at how many steps it takes to get a guest house license. On paper, that license is meant to be only, I think, 200,000 chat. But in practice, it was taking these small businesses a year and a half, and at least 10 times that, because of all the bits of paper they needed to get together to put into the dossier to take up there. So it wasn't just the Ministry of Hotels and Tourism that was also expecting <coughs> sort of extra fees. It was all the other departments who needed to produce a letter. And there's so much of that kind of, oh, you need a letter from here and here and here and here. Why? You know, a lot of these uh, procedures just need to be questioned. So um, I think the more that uh, the business community, whether it's the Chamber of Commerce or someone else, can actually map some of these processes and put them in front of governments and say, if you want to improve, here she is. So at least if you can actually say, you want to improve SME investment climate, this is what is hampering SMEs. It's not whether or not they have a smart card, it's the fact that it takes them two years to get a license and multiple trips around the country and up to Napier. That's what is really hampering the economy. We need an active anti-corruption commission. The anti-corruption commission that was appointed in 2000 and I think 13 or 14, has been very, very slow, lacked initiative, got bogged down in, in tiny complaints of, you know, this, this person asked me for a 10,000 chat payment when I went to register my land certificate. When we went to see them a couple of years ago, and we said, do you talk to business? They said, no. We said, well, why not? And they said, well, it's not illegal under our law for businesses to pay bribes, so we don't have to explain to them about not paying bribes. So we said, well, at least why don't you go and ask them where it is they're having to pay bribes, then you'll know which civil servants to go and talk to. So they lack any kind of real strategic, targeted focus. The other day, the, um, the age of the commissioners was raised by government, by this government, from 70 to 75. We expected that that wasn't because they wanted them all to be asleep, but because there was somebody that Nansa Suchi wanted to appoint as the chair of the commission who currently is 70. We're still waiting for his appointment. It would certainly be a better step than the ones we have at the moment, who frankly are really not doing their job at all. Um, we need more accountability from civil society and the media. One of the most worrying things about the 66D problem in the telecoms law about defamation is that it chills investigative journalism into cases of corruption. 
Um, and we need transparency watchdogs. The moment we have very few civil society organizations working on this issue, there is no transparency international in Myanmar. The network globally would love somebody to do that, but it needs to be a Myanmar person who wants to make it happen. You know, it can't be me, it's got to be somebody who really cares about this issue, is willing to take a certain amount of risks, but I think those risks have reduced in recent years. We have um, one or two initiatives like uh, Dr. Nyo Nyo Thin, who was a Yangon MP who set up something called Yangon Watch. So she's targeted on the uh, public sector in Rangoon, YCDC, Yangon Regional Government. So those are really good initiatives, but we need more of that because we really need people to be asking questions, including obviously members of parliament who have an enormously important role to play in oversight. And then we also need business commitments, and it needs to be both individual and collective. So I just want to make a quick detour right now. I touched on it a bit, this question of donations. It's something that worries me a lot. Uh, it's something that MCRB has worked on quite a bit to try to get across the fact that CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility, if you want to use that phrase, we don't. We don't particularly like it. We think it has a lot of kind of meanings around these donations, philanthropy rather than responsibility. But if you do want to talk about CSR, don't say how much you're going to spend on it. Don't ask companies when they go to Myanmar Investment Commission, what percentage of your pre-tax profits will you be spending on CSR? Because what we have seen is that many companies say, oh, well, right, what do we have to write it here? And then they put their bribe budget into their CSR budget. We've gone on the ground talking to mining companies who said, oh yes, we do a lot of CSR, and they've shown us they're actually keeping a, a list, but it's all payments to village headmen to say, yes, this mine is fine, no problems at all. Or it can be the, um, particularly when you have chief ministers in the regions who have no budget and they're under a lot of pressure to change, and along comes the crony businessman who previously did this and now he's seeing an opportunity again. Let me help you. You know, let me give you some scholarships. Let me buy your car for you. There's a real risk that this government is very vulnerable to that and it's exacerbated by this focus on CSR as, as spending. Um, I talked about the way the sand mining bribe was basically described as a donation. We had a case the other day of a company who was being asked by the immigration department for a $2,000 donation, a donation, that was what they said, for um, saying that it was all right for this foreigner to stay in a private house, which actually the paperwork said it was already that, but the immigration officer was saying, no, 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 it's against the law, but a $2,000 donation, and it will then become fine, and I will not bother you anymore. So this donation world is becoming quite malignant. And what we're also seeing in a slightly different way is communities seeing their relationship with companies as being all about how much money can we get out of them, how can we squeeze them. We're seeing it particularly with the tower companies. They're putting up these towers in remote areas. And frankly, they are not an unalloyed good. You may get a better signal, but you'll also get generator noise going through the night. So there is, I would say, the communities definitely have a case for saying we want something more than just a tower in our, our village. But it's getting to the point where either the community or in some cases the ethnic armed groups is basically saying, right, we will block you until you've paid 500,000 chats a month into our development fund as a donation or to our, um, you know, the general who runs this particular battalion. So it's, it's a very slippery slope here around donations and corruption. What we try and get people to do is think about, if they're going to use the word CSR, what are they talking about? And what we've divided it into here is things which are connected to the business and then things which require money or extra effort. Nobody should ever claim that they are doing CSR when they have installed a wastewater treatment facility. They cause the problem, <coughs> they need to fix it. That's an obligation. That's not, you know, 
that's not from the goodness of their heart. They should have to do it, they cause the problem. So anything to do with either obeying the law or also addressing your negative impacts needs to be over here. Then you've got the things which are connected to your business, which are often called phrases like creating shared value. I'll, I'll come on to that in a minute. Or sustainability. In other words, what can you do that your um, business can either make things better for society or better for the environment? Can you reduce your water usage? Can you reduce your energy usage? Can you employ more local people? It's not necessarily a legal requirement, but it makes things much more um, better for the local community and it builds your social license to operate as a company, which is not something on paper, but it's the reason people don't come and throw rocks at your factory. And then on this side, you've got the stuff which is not business connected. Or is it? Things like sponsorship. Whenever I ask the audience who is the most responsible company in Myanmar, which Myanmar company, which one is the most responsible person, there's usually silence. We wait for about five minutes. And eventually someone normally puts up their hand and says, Max Myanmar. And I say, why? Why is that? Thinking perhaps that they will talk about the quality of their petrol at their service stations, which the taxi drivers tell me is very good, or the fact that they settled their land disputes in their hotel in Chantha. But no, what they say is because they sponsor the football. But why do they do that? Is that for society or is that for marketing? There's a marketing man here who used to work for cigarettes, <laughs> smiling. So I think some of these things in the middle here, you could call it creating shared value because everyone loves football, but you could also just call it marketing. So it's, it's actually in the end quite difficult to pull out of that what is your 2% CSR. It should be very bound up with your business. It should be, as we go on to say here, about this creating shared value. It should actually be good for your business and good for society. So these are some examples of creating shared value from Myanmar. The bank that develops mobile money services. It's a great product for them. It means more people use their bank. But it also helps people who don't have access to cities to go and, and use banks. So Telenor, Wave Money. An example of that, and we're now seeing um, MP, uh, M. Paisan from Oradu. This is uh, an inlay hotel um, who have built up their local vegetable supply chain in the area and got them to be reducing pesticide usage um, and providing new kinds of lettuce that their Italian guests will want to eat. This is quite a famous one, Unilever, do this globally, teach children how to brush their teeth and wash their hands because then they will use soap and toothpaste. They're good for their profits, but also good for child's health. This is Hilton, and they have a great training school in Nakendor, and they have deliberately gone out and recruited from people who would not otherwise get jobs working for an international hotel, and they've just put them through a, a year or more than a year's training and actually given them all jobs if they want to have them. And then this one is Heineken in Morby, who have helped local companies to raise their standards so that they can source their cleaning services and gardening services from local companies rather than from downtown Yangon. So it's, it's good for them because in the end it actually reduces their costs um, by using local services, but it's also good for the local community. So that's what we want to see the government focusing on. How is a company going to create shared value, not how much of their pre-tax profit they're going to spend on CSR? So finally, I just want to talk a bit about businesses' responsibility here. They have a responsibility which is usually seen as being both individual and collective. So individual means it's ensuring that you've worked out what your corruption risk is, ensuring you've got policies that your staff understand how to act when they're asked for bribes, how to push back. Um, that may help if they have, for example, you know, the anti-corruption code, it may also help, for example, if they go in pairs. If you think you're going to be in a situation where you're going to be asked for a bribe, you reduce the risk of that just by having two of you there and having effectively a witness. So helping companies to develop their own policies on political donations and so on, that's, that's a part of um, thinking through how can they fight corruption. 
but they've also got to make sure it works all the way down their supply chain. So it's no good the company saying, yes, we don't pay bribes, but actually their subcontractor constructor is busy, the construction company is busy paying the bribes. That's just outsourcing it to an agent. And then collective action. This is an example of why collective action is necessary. If you're on your own, particularly as an SME, you get eaten. But if you go for collective action, you can chase them away and change the system. <coughs> so it's fine if you're telling or if you're coke, you can pull the strings at the top to say, we are not gonna pay, pay a bribe to get our furniture out of customs. But if you are a small SME, you need to come together and fight these things, not separately. So this is one example of collective action against corruption that you see in, in Thailand now. It's, it's quite kind of top down, but it's sending a strong sign of leadership from the company that they want to be part of this coalition. Um, so, so basically, it's a commitment by the company which then gets assessed by the Institute of Directors, and if there is signs that they're not meeting it, then they get kicked out of the coalition. So they're required to put the various processes that I just described in place, but also to talk more about what they're doing and be a public leadership voice against corruption. And then you've also got something which we are looking to see whether it will work here. We heard from those figures that construction is the major problem. So about 10 years ago, this thing called the Construction Sector Transparency Initiative was introduced, um, and it's around trying to improve government processes above all, but it has, needs to have buy-in from companies and from civil society as well. So we've got the executive director of COST coming here in 10 days time, and we're gonna go and take him to meet Yangon regional governments. What it is really about is addressing a sort of global standard for the way that public projects like building a road or an overpass are tendered for, and are then spent so that you have a way of monitoring them and disclosing that information so you can see is there a massive cost overrun, uh, how many people tendered for it, all of that kind of thing. Um, it's something which has already been adopted in, in Thailand, um, in Vietnam, I think, um, uh, Philippines. And so they're interested to see is there interest in doing it here, primarily from the government. So, we're, our advice to them was talk to the Yangon regional government because it's where most of the construction activity happens and where you have a lot of forces pushing in different directions around this, some for greater transparency and some pushing for the old days. So companies usually make these kind of excuses when you talk to them, you know, why aren't you going to do something about corruption? It's, first of all, I'd say that siege mentality, those small fish, well, we can only compete because we know that our competitor is paying. So we're, we're, we have to do this. Or just that's the way things have always been. Um, we've always done it, that's the way things work around here. Um, some claim ignorance. We didn't know that our agent was paying bribes, or that he should have done. Or we didn't know that was a bribe. And I think in some cases here, there isn't yet that recognition that everything I was describing there is actually a form of bribery, employing the minister's son, sending him off on, uh, on a shopping trip in Bangkok, pretending it's not a bribe. Really? Taking the, the minister out shopping in Bangkok, giving a, a fruit basket with a jade necklace underneath, all of which are examples I've heard not that long ago. Um, not testing your systems, saying, you know, we, what we thought of our systems were up to the job. There will always be corruption, but if you, certainly if you're in a Western country and you get caught out by government, if you can show your systems really were up to the job, then you get punished much less. But if actually you've got that complacency of, well, you know, it's basically just on paper and nobody ever got trained on it, nobody was aware of it, then if you're a German company or a UK company, you will get significantly fined if this comes out and your directors might even go to jail. So this is something which you'll find in this Transparency International Guide that we, we translated, which is what they regard as sort of six step for a company. Starting off with a commitment from the top, from the leadership. If it doesn't come from the top, it's not gonna work. And then assessing the current status and the risk environment by having conversations with your staff. 
and not just your senior managers who may be, well be totally unaware of what their lorry drivers are going through. You've actually got to get down to the people who are, you know, the sales managers and get them to open up about where they do get exposed in these areas and then get them to talk through how they could be better protected so they could avoid paying, paying bribes and then develop that into a program and a plan and monitor how it's going and report on it as well, both internally, because there will be things that your board should know, but also externally, basic stuff about what you're doing. So not all the details, not all the details of who paid what, but how many cases, for example, there have been, how many people got fired. Because that's something that will also give confidence both to your business partners, but also will send a signal to your staff that you can't get away with this. And then there are various online tools. I'll just show you this one. Um, I won't go online, but I've taken some screenshots. You can download this for free. Um, and it's by the Institute of Business Ethics in uh, the UK. So it's a bit geared towards a more developed market. But you can put yourself into various situations. I'm not sure whether I'd see myself down the tax office sort of turning on my app and saying, right, what do I have to do? But you can look through how this works. So the situation that you need help with is I want to offer hospitality. I want to take somebody out to dinner. And it's a public official. So what is the advice here? The advice is it might be okay, but you should check first. You should ask. Because the company will probably have a policy of what kind of hospitality you can offer, what level of dinner can you offer, or if it's you know corporate football tickets or whatever, how how can you do that and to who? And is there some decision that this official is going to be making on your behalf, which therefore means probably you can't offer it in this situation? Because often it's fine to build a relationship with government officials, but not with the ones that have life and death power over your company. So the advice here is speak to the legal department and someone responsible for government contracts to find out whether or not this is somebody who is particularly someone not to be offering hospitality to, otherwise it could be perceived as a bribe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Picky Bowman. All here experienced. <laughs> yeah. Now I would like to welcome questions from the audience. We have 20 minutes for the question and answer session. Please keep in smiling. Yeah, tell, I mean, tell your experiences. I mean, <laughs> um, <clears throat> my, my name is Luke. I've been here not quite as long as, uh, as Vicky, but uh, 24 years. And yes, I've been in business uh, all along, uh, running a, a large company to start with, uh, which was in tobacco. So forget about the tobacco aspect of it, but uh, it was a British company. And as a country manager, obviously, as Vicky said, uh, we could not do, I could not do anything uh, improper regarding corruption, because not only I would lose my job, but also I would be pr prosecuted back home in, in the UK. So uh, my experience is that definitely uh, it was possible to do even large business in Myanmar uh, being totally clean, uh, not condoning, not doing uh, uh, corruption at all. Um, it's not in a special sequence, but I, I would like to pick up on a few things. Transparency International Ranking, I totally agree with Vicky. A few years back, it was at the level of uh, Central African Republic. I lived three years myself in Central African Republic, and I can tell you it's, it's not correct. The ranking was not correct at that time. Um, CSR, I uh, also agree with Vicky. Uh, I think this, this term has been abused. Uh, and in tobacco, we were kind of pioneer of CSR because maybe we had something to, uh, some, some sympathy to gain from the public, the authorities, the, the society in general, because we were selling a product that was not really good for, for your health. Uh, and, and we pioneered that and spent a lot of money in. Uh, planting trees and building schools and, uh, and cleaning beaches, all things not related at all to our business. 
And, and I believe that uh, uh, the ultimate CSR for a company in Myanmar is to create what I, what I call a life-changing quality job opportunity. Just do your job. And I, and I honestly believe, I don't know if it's still the rule uh, at the MIC level that you need to put a percentage of your uh, turnover or budget into CSR. I don't think this is right. Because it seems to be in some people's licenses, but or permits, but not others. It's not in the law and yeah. rules, but some people have got it in their, their permit, I'm told. My view is that if you do your business right, responsibly, you treat your people right, you treat the environment right, you pay your taxes, that's all you need to do. And some other people who are in school building or in tree planting or will do that much better than you can do it and more, much more efficiently and it's not your job to do that. So I really believe that um, responsible business is, is the more important aspect than, than trying to, because you look at some websites today of local companies and you see the chairman is doing, all he's doing all day is to, to give away rice, food, uh, opening schools and this and that. It cannot be right. It's not good for the business. Uh, responsible business, why we promote that is because in the end, it makes more money. So it is good business. Uh, it, we don't do that for charity. We do that because it is a better idea. It makes more money at the end. Of course, sometimes it, it takes a little longer, but, um, and maybe one, one more point, I'll ask that I'll finish. Uh, one of the key problem in Myanmar when you look at the investors is of course energy and then uh, clarity of uh, government policies and retention of people, capacity is, is very high. By the way, corruption is not that high. It is on the list, but not that high. And, uh, but uh, we do focus now a lot on uh, human resources. And if you are working for a company that is doing everything responsibly, your chances of retaining people is much higher. Everybody complains, I cannot retain my people, they all leave. Uh, and, and it's not for the salary. The salary is, I, I cannot go into it, uh, it will be too long explanation, but there are factors that create dissatisfaction and create other factors creating satisfaction in a job. And the opposite of dissatisfaction is not satisfaction, it's not is non-dissatisfaction. And salary is clearly in that category. That means a salary is an element why you will leave a company if you're not paid enough, but it's not the reason why you would stay in a company even if you're overpaid. Is, is that clear? And I like the, the example of Henneken, for instance. If, if in Moby, and I, I was not aware of that, just learned that today, um, uh, you work in Henneken and your brother as an SME doing the gardening of Henneken, uh, now you have two good reasons to stay in the company. And, and the feel-good factor uh, is all these little things. If you, if you do everything responsibly, then you create a feel-good factor in the company and people stay in the company. So it helps with retention as well. There's, there's actually a <coughs> survey that was done a couple of years ago in the USA where people were rung up and asked how much extra money would it take to persuade them to leave their company and go and work for a company with a good reputation or a company with a bad reputation? And I think they wanted like a 25% salary increase to work for a company with a good reputation, but a 40% increase to go to a bad company. In other words, companies who don't do business responsibly end up having to pay their staff more which is probably why salary is in the tobacco industry quite hard. And maybe the, the last one is the, uh, I didn't see the, the World Bank uh, latest numbers on, on the decrease of corruption, but, but that's very good news, obviously. And now uh, in these days where the business community has nothing much to say positive about this government, I think this is something that should be reminded. Red tape, this red tape, 
And so I say, okay, have you, have you worked with your local chamber to sort of feed these points into government? And they say, no, I'm not joining the local chamber, it's a bunch of cronies, I'm not interested. And so the problem here in Myanmar is that for many years, it's only been the Chamber of Commerce that has existed as a business body. There are various other groupings. Um, a couple of years ago, or five years ago, there's the Myanmar business executives who were on the sort of rise. But I would say that they spend more of their time kind of doing this stuff rather than advocacy to government. There's also now Myanmar Young Entrepreneurs Association, which has kind of, I would say, taken over a bit from MBE. But yet, again, it's a bit more around this kind of thing rather than regulatory and investment climate advocacy. There is something that has started to form, but whether or not it will take off, I don't know. And I'm trying to remember its exact name, um, but it has, I think, SME in the title. I can, I can tell you if you, you want. They will be having a meeting in about two weeks' time, which is being sponsored by um, the UK DFID, the DNAP facility. Maybe that can be the opportunity to create a proper business group that represents SMEs. Um, in, in the UK, you have something called the CBI, the Confederation of British Industry, for big companies. But you also have the sort of association of small business own owners who also advocate to government uh, and are taken very seriously because there's a recognition that the problems they face are sometimes different from the problems the big guys face. So I think the answer to your question is, is no, it's needed. Um, the trouble if you're an SME is you don't have the time and people to put effort into it, you know, to send somebody along to meetings. So really there needs to be some way of making this organisation start to function so that people start to send a, a membership fee to it and then they can employ staff who do, do the job and feed in their views collectively to government. Sort of what you've been seeing in terms of corruption, changing the behavioral mindset at the rural level because the change you said the change has to come from the top. But even if the change has started at the top, the amount of change there's just the problem SME has they can't afford for someone to like go back and forth at the rural level or at the remote level. What have you seen in terms of like the behavioral mindset of? that level playing field, if I pay money, I get it faster. How does that mindset is changing? What's the time factor? If some of the time factor is considered, it's too, it becomes too late. I think, I think these things, uh, there's two elements to this. The first is that on the government level, it's changed at the top, but it hasn't changed all the way down. And there's still a very, very strong control mentality from officials, a sense that they've got to be signing off on everything. This is coming out with a, a draft law on health and safety, which requires the inspector general from the employment agency, MOLIP, to sign off to approve every company before they start their business a month before to say that they have all their safety plans in place. It's crazy. I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of companies here potentially. And you know, if you're a downtown lawyer's office, you do not need that person to be signing off to say that you've got a policy in place to not polish your floors so people don't slip over. But it's in the mindset, no, no, we must, somebody must sign, there must be a chop. So that mentality has to change. Um, and I don't see, unfortunately, that happening through the way that laws are being developed. We are constantly pushing for laws to be publicly consulted on so that businesses can say, this is not going to work. You know, you must be joking, you're telling me I'm going to have to do this. That department tells me I have to do this. I can't actually do that and that and that. And that's where you end up with people saying, okay, so how much do I have to pay? You know, you're asking me for six pieces of paper of which it is impossible to get six out of six. You know, they all conflict with one another effectively. So how much is it? I met somebody the other day who is importing swimming pool, swimming pool chemicals. And she is trying to do this the right way and get a hazardous chemical license. So she took the sample to the Ministry of Industry and they said, well, we can't give you a license until you have an import permit. It, oh, sorry, we can't give you a license until you show us your contract that you're going to be buying this. And she said, well, I'm not going to put in my order 
and pay money until I know that this chemical can be imported into this country. But I'm giving you this chemical with all its chemical details to get a license to say it's okay to bring that into Myanmar. No, no, you have to show us your, your purchase contract. And I don't know whether that person was wanting money or just didn't understand how businesses do business. But they were insistent on this, and in the end this person had to go up to the DG level and explain this does not make sense. So that is part of the problem in terms of mentality and mindset, and it's part capability and it's part attitude. But then on the business side, what we've seen is it's really the younger generation that want to make change. I've pretty much given up over on anyone over the age of 60. Um, We've, we've tried to do this a little bit working with sort of business coalitions of established businesses, but for them it's, this is the way we've always done it. So it's the younger generation who've lived in Singapore, who've lived in the US, who are trying to change things. Those are, those are the ones that I think we need to, to work with, including through these kind of SME groupings and startup groupings to try to get things changed. Unfortunately, given Myanmar youth discrimination, it's quite difficult for those people to get their voice heard. Uh, but they're, they're definitely the voices of change and reform in this area. Yeah. Oh, so, in terms of mindset, and then, uh, are there any uh, education to our younger generation right now? Because, uh, you know, it's kind of culture right now, corruption is kind of culture. So, if young generation don't know if this is right or wrong, they do the same way. Yeah. So, I want to know, are there such kind of education or whatnot? Because, uh, you have to tell me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just the, people just study for passing the exam, so yes. yeah. I don't know what's going on here. Well, I know what's going on here in Paramount Institute. Yeah, I know. So <laughs> it sounds like this is great, but uh, you yeah. know, at the yeah. local, better, yeah. better, better, better. At the back, have you got a comment on that? So, uh, I have a question regarding, um, I think a lot of the companies that would be scared um, because you know, their own uh, country governments in UK, US, and they would comply with the German board with you. Suggestions, but I would uh, also I think about other companies. Uh, the huge majority uh, perhaps a high percentage a percentage of uh, companies of countries uh, that wouldn't care that much. So how do you try to convince these companies? Yeah, I think it's, it's very difficult. Um, the uh, the UN Convention on Anti Corruption is a global convention which most countries have signed up to, but the thing which actually has teeth is an OECD convention. For, so OECD, I don't know if you know, is the organization in Paris that most developing countries belong to. So it's that that leads to these laws in the UK and the US and so on. So yeah, most of Asia doesn't have any of that. China doesn't have that. That said, China has a kind of anti-corruption campaign, but I'm not sure that they see that extending to their overseas companies' activities. Um, but there it comes down to the government here, the host government here, has to make it not possible. Because my experience is that if laws are clear, companies, whether they're Chinese companies, Thai companies, Japanese companies, UK companies, are happier than if laws are unclear and they have to pay bribes. We met a Chinese company a couple of years ago, a small mining company, nothing to do with the state, um, who came to us asking for advice. And it was rather sweet. They were like, but can you tell us who we need to give the red envelopes to? <laughs> because our permit is stuck. And I said, well, you know, the reason I think your permit is stuck is actually because you know, two people have died on your work camp, on work site, and things like that. It was through the way you did business. So if you can fix that, you will get your permits without having to pay the red envelopes. Um, so, so I think you know, it's, it's definitely easier to persuade a Norwegian company than a Chinese company that this matters. But in the end, it's in the, in the Chinese company's interests for the system to work and for them to do business responsibly. Yeah. So, hi, I'm a toy guy, and for, for instance, I travel, for instance, I travel all over the country. So, what I want to say is, I think it has something to do with education and politics, uh, politics as well. For example, it's your seminar or forum or talk show, whatever it is, it's really cool, awesome. But, to be honest, 
over the last 50 years, education has toddled, and we are trying to change it. For example, I travel a lot, and just a couple of months ago, I want to situate, for example. So at the situate airport, there were the porters and the staff working for the airline. I don't want to mention the name. So for, for example, many people do not know English, but we have a lot of educated people. So as an, or, as an ordinary person, how can we fight against? For example, we are still weak in sharing knowledge. So, for example, at, at the airport, there were a lot of people in a line, and the, one of the staff from the airline asked the people for money. So they asked, 2,000 just, 3,000 just, for what, I asked. No, just just for the workers need to know it's like a donations or gifts, whatever it is. Just as ordinary people, I showed the slide, and as we said earlier, collectively, it's like a strand that we can fight against corruption. But I think we're still coping with fear. So I know, but I have my clients or guests. Oh, why are you paying? You don't need to pay. But I dare not. So it's going to disturb. So as ordinary person, how or what can we do for anti-corruption? So I think I want to share with my people. Thanks so much. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a very good point. And, it's, and I think it does take a lot of guts to say no. <laughs> Probably in that situation, I think it's impossible to say no, but you might want to say yeah, whatever, you know, it is. Um, but uh, there's a, an other initiative which I didn't talk about, it's called I Paid a Bribe, which if you go online and, and search it, it's something which started in India, where um, the, the purpose of it was to crowdsource data about problems, about hotspots. And you could go on as an individual, having paid your 5,000 chat to sit way immigration, and say, I paid 5,000 chat to sit where immigration on the 10th of, of January. Um, and you don't say the name of the person, you don't say your name, but then collectively, these things start to show up. You know, you start to see that sit where immigration is a real problem. And then that gets elevated because, for example, if you've got a sort of good media campaign about it, your website manager will say, okay, this year, we got these, you know, these are the top 10 places where people are paying bribes. And that will then have an impact. The, I think the example I was giving you of the, the donation to immigration, the advice I gave the company, because they asked me what should I do, and I said, well, you're an American. Tell them you're going to have to tell your embassy that you've been instructed by your embassy that you must inform them about all requests for bribes. Um, so they, they wrote a letter. I don't know if they even sent it to the embassy, but they showed it to immigration saying, this is the letter we've sent. And immigration was like, But they backed off. <laughs> this department is now calling the company saying, you won't tell anybody, will you? You won't tell anybody we asked you. So I think when you push back, it does actually work. It's, it's to some extent easier to push back against government officials now than it is in some of these other situations like I just mentioned on the communities or the ethnic armed groups. Um, I think that sort of tone from the top and the, the fact that they're seeing more naming and shaming and people losing their jobs, it is playing through into their consciousness. Excuse me, can I add? Yeah. If not immigration, for example, the immigration is over here and we have the check-in counter. So the staff yeah. from a certain airline asking for it. Surprisingly, every single one pays. Yeah. You know, nothing. Yeah. Oh, two thousand chips here. Okay. It's very <laughs> well, I mean, then there are things you can also do which make yeah. people get nervous, which is like ask for a receipt. Um, and also another thing that we encourage companies to do as part of our transparency thing is have a, you know, to, to bring up or to, to send an email to the airline saying you do understand that your staff in this place are, are doing the following things. But I um, just wanted the people not to get me around, not immigration. Yeah, and, and I mean, I, I think you've got to be careful in these things because in some cases you will put yourself at risk. But I think complaining about an airline staff is easy enough to do. Very little comeback you're likely to get. Well, maybe as a tour guide, you might get your clients bumped. I don't know. <laughs> Thanks so much.
I'm yeah. sorry, but because of the limitation, this will be the last question. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, could you please uh, go back to the spectrum of uh, corporate yeah. social responsibility? Thank you very much. It has given me a lot of food to um, feed and think about, in fact, here. Uh, creating shared value, for example, Parma Institute, we can, I can go to a company, let's say Cambodia Bank, and then say, you know, we are empowering the youth, and then these, the youth can be beneficial to companies, and then thereby creating the shared, shared, shared value in this instance. Um, but then I can, oh, I can think of other situations in which it's going to be hard to imagine, um, see um, shared value. For example, donating money to um, a blind school. I mean, you can say, you know, we can empower the, 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 